you the considerations and factors that are important for you when thinking about participating. Um, but before we uh, ask all of you to share your thoughts, uh, it's my uh, honor to introduce one of our uh, PFDD co-chairs, Dr. James Simon, who is a staff nephrologist at the Cleveland Clinic, where caring for patients with Alport syndrome is actually one of his main areas of interest. Um, Dr. Simon is going to be uh, leading us in a discussion um, to highlight some of the challenges in clinical trial design in Alport syndrome. Dr. Simon. First, I'd like to uh, thank everybody for allowing me to be here. Um, I consider it a privilege. Um, I tell Sharon all the time that this, anytime I interact with her or the Alcourt Center Foundation or come to a meeting, I feel re-energized. Um, the day-to-day -day grind of, of work can be, uh, you know, depressing in its own right sometimes, but, you know, being part of such a special group always uh, reminds me why I'm a physician. And, uh, again, I'd like to thank you. So a little bit of why an adult nephrologist is up here talking to you about a genetic disease. And um, my first patient that I diagnosed with Alport syndrome, I uh, was precepting fellows clinic. And so the fellows are the trainees who are going to be future nephrologists. And medical education was always one of my passions as well. And I always trained my fellows never to accept somebody else's diagnosis. And when I'm on rotation with them in the hospital, I said, your job is to turn over one diagnosis and make and change diagnosis. And so I always challenge them to think critically about, about the care that they're getting, especially if it's been um, received from another provider. And so a, a lady in her 40s came in. She had been diagnosed with biopsy six years prior with FSGS, which is a scarring condition of the kidneys that causes protein in the urine and kidney failure. And it is treated most commonly with immunosuppressants. So prednisone, she was on... Uh, a transplant medicine called tacrolimus, which didn't work, and then she had been placed on Celsept, and she was on Celsept and prednisone for the last six years with all the complications that can come with that, with still progressive kidney dysfunction, still lots of protein in her urine. And first thing I said was, that doesn't make any sense. So we go back and we look at her urine under the microscope and see all this blood. And I said, okay, we're starting over. So we go back in, start talking to her, talk about family history. Her brother's uh, on dialysis. He wears hearing aids, but that's because he was a DJ. And so I say, okay, stop. You know, we called BS on that. We started over. We did another biopsy. Had a better pathologist this time. We saw Alport syndrome. Went back and looked at the old slides. Saw Alport syndrome in the original biopsy. But unfortunately, most, many pathologists see FSGS and they stop looking. And so um, we pulled her off from immunosuppressants and successfully able to get her transplanted. And so over the course of the next couple of years, I diagnosed six or seven more patients, most of which were misdiagnosed with other diseases, coming in with cataracts and diabetes and osteoporosis or joint problems from some of steroids and with hearing aids and no one making the connection. And so, um, you know, as an adult nephrologist, when the paper came out that F, you know, a certain number of patients, 10 to 12 percent of patients with FSGS that don't respond to steroids actually have Alport syndrome. My response was, well, yeah, no, you know, no kidding. Um, but, uh, and just looking out at the audience, you can see that what we learn in medical school at Alport syndrome is all like Grant, who are young men with X linked and going into kidney failure or have hearing loss. That's just not the case. And so, one of the things that we'll be discussing is just how difficult it is to diagnose Alport syndrome because it's such, such a more heterogeneous disease than, than we know. And just trying to figure out how many people have Alport syndrome is difficult. The common figure that's, that's thrown around is one in 5,000. And going back and looking at the original article from 1983, that was based upon a group of uh, physicians in Utah and southern Idaho, and they just counted all the cases of Alport syndrome and divided by the number of patients in those counties. And they came up with one in, um, one in 5,000. And this was before genetics, the genetic mutations were even discovered. Uh, in Finland, they came up with one in 53,000, and that was just surveying all of their doctors, how many patients do you have with Alport syndrome? Again, genetics was not used in that study. So somewhere between one in 5,000 and one in 50,000. Yeah, we think it's closer to one in 5,000, as I'll talk about, because there are a lot fewer people diagnosed than actually have the disease. But that impacts our ability to develop studies. Understanding how easy it is going to be to recruit this ultra-rare disease because we don't know how many people in the country have the disease or how many people in the world have the disease 
makes it hard for companies to, under, to understand how much, how, how, how to size the study, what we call the power of the study. And it's basically because this disease is heterogeneous. It's on, as we've learned, it's on three different genes, three different inheritance types, and multiple different severities of mutations. So just trying to figure out the impact of who has what kind of disease has changed as our ability to do genetic testing has changed. We previously had always thought that 85% of Alport syndrome was excellent. And if you look, uh, the division equally was between missense versus nonsense or deletion. Now the missense is the one that Dr. Rowe talked about where the, the protein is made, it just may not function properly, and so they may have less severe disease versus if the protein's not made, the nonsense or deletion mutations will have the classic disease. And only 15% would have what we call the autosomal diseases, most of that being recessive, which as, as Dr. Rowe also said, acts a lot like the X-linked disease. But with next generation sequencing, we know that there's a lot more autosomal dominant disease out there and there's a lot of debate about what to call that. Is that thin basement membrane disease that may progress onto renal failure? Is that autosomal dominant Alport syndrome? And so the important thing to know is that, as we've discussed, the type of mutation matters. If you look at excellent males, based on their type of mutation by the age of 30, those that have a severe mutation, nonsense or deletion, 90% will be in kidney failure and 90% will have some form of hearing loss by the age of 30. And it goes down based upon the severity of the mutation to missense mutations where it's only 50% are going to be in kidney failure by the age of 30. And 60% will have hearing loss, which is why I get the opportunity and the privilege to diagnose Alport syndrome in my clinic. Because there are people, and this is just males, never mind the females who are all over the map um, as far as how they progress. And uh, we know an autosomal recessive acts very much like excellent males. And then autosomal dominant is very variable, as, as well as uh, excellent females. So this autosomal heterozygous, this is the autosomal dominant, the, if you have one mutation on one of your alpha-3 or alpha-4 genes. It's still underestimated, we think. If you look at patients with um, with the, these mutations and look at their family history, there is a significant um, history of hearing loss and kidney in involvement in these patients. Uh, the term thin basement membrane disease, you may or may not have heard of this, benign familial hematuria, which just, you know, talk about, um, you know, dismissing a disease, calling it benign, which is what we used to think, even though we know a significant portion go on to have kidney involvement. And 40% of people with this thin basement membrane disease have a, have a, t a collagen 4 mutation. And 1% of the population has thin basement membrane disease, it's estimated. So just think about 40% of 1% of the population having some form of what we consider thin basement membrane or autosomal dominant Alport syndrome. So we do, that's again why we think this is such an underdiagnosed disease in one form or another. And the presentation, as we've all heard, can range, can, you know, it has a big range from isolated blood in the urine that you can't see, microscopic hematuria, to the classic involvement. Um, you know, if it's not present in the classic textbook way that we've learned in medical school, it will get misdiagnosed or it will get dismissed. Um, females who present with microscopic hematuria, how many of you were put on Cipro the first couple times you got, you came in and someone found blood in your urine because they thought it was a UTI. And so, right, and, and it, that's just unfortunately part of the part of the trials. And you know, Dr. Rowe is really one of the most vocal advocates for females with uh, Alport syndrome. But uh, you know, the term carrier is is just dismissive of the fact that by by definition, if you have blood in your urine, you have the disease because your GBM is not working. And so it, there the, there are no carriers. Um, and if we can get that out into the lexicon and get that out in the understanding, then. You know, women who have hearing loss and blood in their urine but may not have kidney failure will not be ignored. And, and I've heard so many stories about the guilt of not being diagnosed properly and then having a boy who gets classic Alport syndrome. And so, um, you know, this idea that, that there's a carrier uh, is, is really needs to be eradicated so that we can take, uh, take this um, disease seriously. Uh, and again, 18% of women are going to get, going to kidney failure by the age of 60, that's not a benign disease. And if we go on to the varied diagnoses, trying to design a study when 
the presentations are so variable, can be very difficult. 15% of patients don't have a family history. So using a family history as part of the diagnostic criteria, if you don't have a biopsy or genetics, isn't always going to catch everybody. If you have just isolated blood in the urine, there's a wide differential for that. Alport syndrome is just one part of that. And most, a lot of people aren't biopsied if they just have a little blood in the urine and they don't have anything else going on, no protein, no kidney failure. So they go undiagnosed. And then there's the, uh, the overvalue of the necessity of the hearing loss in the diagnosis. I've caught several patients where previous nephrologists said, well, the hearing loss started too late, or they don't have hearing loss, so they didn't consider Alport syndrome. And um, again, why even our own colleagues don't make this diagnosis correctly. And then how do we recruit? How do you design the study? When, when, when the companies are looking to figure out how they're going to prove, and this gets into statistics that we don't need to get into, but they have to prove that their intervention works, which means they have to have a population who's going to get worse without the intervention, so they can hope that when they give the medicine, that patient's population either doesn't get worse or gets worse slower, or God forbid we actually get something that gets people better, right? And so if you focus on the worst population, the excellent males who are progressing, well, those are all kids, and how hard is it to get a young boy or a man in their 20s to come in and participate in a, renal, in a drug study where they have to come in every week or every two weeks? It's probably the most difficult population to study, right? The females, the moms, the sisters, the, you know, they're more engaged, whether it's just natural altruism or, or um, what, we don't know, but we see that. And um, they want to contribute, but they often progress more slowly. And so if you engage, if you enroll a lot of patients who may not be progressing, that's going to have, cause a problem with you identifying the benefits of your treatment. It causes you to have to recruit more people, called your power, and that costs a lot more money. So trying to figure out where that sweet spot is between just diagnosing, just including the most severe patients versus including everybody is very difficult. And those are some of the problems that we had trying to um, help design some of these treatment trials. And as we saw with Athena, as we can see in the room, 66% of the patients that, enrolled in, that were enrolled in Athena were female. So again, it's definitely uh, a, a population that, that needs to be looked at closely and carefully when designing the trials. No? Someone standing with a hook on the back of the stage? <laughs> can you advance the slide, please? All right, so <clears throat> basically this is a reiteration of, of what I just said. Can you go on to the next slide? And, and so what we want to do is we want to, what I think is, is to include people who, in these trials, especially the early trials, when you're trying to figure out anybody who's advancing to some degree or another. And I think that's where we had almost gotten to as one of the trials that uh, didn't end up getting, um, getting started. And then what are your outcomes? What are, what, what are you going to have to study as far as how good the drug is working? Is it a hard, what we call the hard outcomes of end-stage renal disease? People actually going on dialysis or needing a transplant? Well, that takes a long time to study. Is it what we call our surrogate outcomes, which are if your creatinine is going, going up less, slow, less quickly, all right, your GFR isn't dropping quite as fast. And, you know, that comes with a lot of people who are in cardinal trial, and when a cardinal changes your GFR immediately, those of us in nephrology don't understand if that's necessarily really doing anything positively in the kidney permanently, or is it just a good thing while you're on the drug, and then you stop the drug and the GFR goes back down. Um, and there's a lot of excitement. I know patients are really, really happy when their GFR goes up, which is why we're, we're you know, we're recruiting into those trials. But, um, you know, there are a lot of questions to be, to be asked about it, whether that's really the right outcome. Um, do you look at proteinuria? Do you look at kidney biopsies? Do you repeat a biopsy a year or two down the line to prove that the actual scarring in the kidney is less severe? That's asking a lot of your patients to go through two biopsies, one before and one after, when they probably already had a biopsy to begin with, at least one. So, again, all of these decisions have to be made, and, and it, it leads to a lot of difficulty in figuring out exactly how to design your trial. And, like we said, 
whether to biopsy or not, I was asked to put this slide in specifically, is, is a, a difficult choice. It depends on the treatment, it depends on how it works, and depends on whether it's going to reduce the scarring. And it also looks, trying to figure out progression, looking at quantifying how much scarring is going on in the kidney is still very subjective. There are some, some pathologists that can use a very, try to objectively look at the amount of scarring, but it's not very reproducible. And so that's a difficult measure in of itself. And then physician awareness of Alport syndrome. All right, so quotes from some of my patients by their nephrologists. Oh, I read about that one time. Google it, you'll learn more than I can teach you. No joke. Okay, so not only is it uh, a misunderstood disease because everyone thinks it has to be the X-linked severe um, presentations, but they just, it's not something on the top of their brain. They're dealing with hypertension and diabetes all the time and heart failure and the kidney problems of those. Um, and then there's a fatalistic approach. They, they, think that pro, they think that the Alport syndrome only helps with blood pressure and proteinuria. They don't understand that it slows the progression of kidney, dis, kidney dysfunction. Um, and because it's a genetic disease without any gene therapies, they really just say, well, we'll just have to, as many of you know, they just watch, watch you go down without helping out. Um, and, you know, most nephrologists are not experts in, in genetic disease, and I certainly don't consider myself an expert in genetic diseases, just to understand the importance of family counseling, um, the implications of the type of mutation, how important it is to fight with the insurance companies to get that paid for. My last two patients, the, the insurance companies have refused to pay for genetics, and it's just inf infuriating. Um, but especially when it presents in adults, when it's not the classic presentation, how important it is to really nail the diagnosis down nail the genetics down so that you can understand how, um, how it's going to impact not only the patient but the rest of their family. And then in just raising awareness of these trials, we, you know, we go through all this, we get the trials up and running and no one's heard of them. You know, the patients know more about it because of Alport Syndrome Foundation, because of, of patient blogs and, and Facebook pages, and they're coming to their doctors telling them about these trials. And so it's not only good enough for the drug companies to uh, design a good trial, but they have to go out and try to educate the providers, the people who are taking care of these patients are missing the diagnosis to think about an ultra-rare disease. If they have a, diagnose, a patient with that diagnosis, to think about these studies. So it is extra work on their part too, and they, they engage with it well, they engage with the, the patient communities, I think, that, um, very well to try to figure out how to get the word out that there are treatment trials or when the Athena was going on, that just how important a registry trial is to better characterize what was un previously an unknown population. And I tell you, everything you said about pregnancy complications, we heard. And we were shouting it, trying to get pregnancy complications recorded as on, on the uh, complications list in the history um, sheets. And we missed a golden opportunity, I think, to really characterize that because it's obvious to all of us in the room now that, that that's really an un unappreciated complication. So, I, hopefully I, I've educated or given you a, a couple of reasons why it's not so easy studying you. And it it's, takes a lot of uh, thought. I think the drug companies, when they get into this realm, the first thing they realize is, oh, this wasn't easy, as easy as we thought it was going to be. They wanted a heterogeneous genetic disease that they could, with the population they could study easily. Um, and it becomes more difficult. And um, the the different difficulties in diagnosing, much less the very variety of how you present, I'll make, I'll make it challenging besides the rarity of the disease. So uh, that's all I have for you today. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Simon, for that uh, informative talk. And you know, I think uh, that's why when we were designing the program for today, um, we thought it was so important to, to include this topic. Um, you know, given the challenges that we just heard about, you know, what can we learn from all of you um, to help us make sure that you know, 